But nice to be with you all. My name's Undu. I'm Hail. And we're the co-founders of Word on the Curb, which is a research and creative consultancy. We specialize in engaging with Gen Z, millennial, and minority groups, working with the likes of Adidas, Spotify, and the NHS. Um, it's great to be here. It's a bit distracting hearing all of that racket over there, but we'll try and concentrate. Um, we're going to spend the next 15 to 20 minutes talking to you about how we work with brands to authentically engage with minority groups and some of the learnings that you can take. There is a prize at the end for the best questions, so please do use the app. Uh, ask us questions. We like to be interactive with the crowd, so please do use the app function. I might get you to do the clicker here for me because I'm carrying a couple of things. Um, so let's get straight into it. This is me in a chicken suit. Now, you're probably wondering one thing. How does he make a chicken suit look so good? If you're not wondering that, you're probably thinking, why on earth is this guy in a chicken suit? Well, if you can cast your minds back to the summer of 2019, tragically, London was in the midst of its most deadly year with regard to serious youth violence. In over a decade at the time, it was uh, at the pinnacle uh, of what it was. And the number of teen deaths via gun and knife violence had seen a significant surge. Go on to the next slide. So the Home Office responded to that by releasing, some of you may remember, knife-free chicken boxes aimed at encouraging young Londoners to put down their knives, as you can see here. This is what it looked like. However, the issue being that using chicken boxes or chicken shops to speak to minority communities in London was a lazy, blanketed and racially insensitive way of engaging with young people for, for obvious reasons. If you go back up, our, our counter campaign involving the team and I in a chicken suit, as you can see, collecting insight on the ground from young people helped to create a bit of a media frenzy that culminated in the redaction of that campaign itself. And it also resulted in us providing consultation to the Home Office and their virtual, their violence reduction units on how to speak to and engage with young people properly. However, this, is, this issue wasn't and isn't unique to the Home Office. It's not just the Home Office who struggle to land messages with young people more broadly and with minority groups more specifically. Which leads me on to mistake number one, not attempting to truly understand your audience. If you go to the next slide. Blanket generalizations are often used to understand Gen Z and the globalized, interconnected world in which they live. But I'm sorry to tell you guys, not all young people are Greta Thunberg. They're not all sustainability experts, and they're not all activists. Are they even Gen Z? Uh, this catch-all um, term which is used to identify this bracketed 11 to 25 year old audience doesn't seem to resonate with young people that we spoke to. We polled our community of over a thousand young people from uh, Gen Z and millennial groups and only 14% said that the, two, the term was suitable for them. So maybe we need to have a rethink about that. Go on to the next slide. When researching these audiences, one of the things that we all tend to love are panels and for good reason. But not all panels are communities. How do we retain engagement and keep those communities incentivized and compelled beyond financial returns? And the other issue is, of course, what are we doing to understand the nuances and diversity in demographic data? With multiculturalism playing an increasing, increasingly important role um, with regard to how we interact with the world and how we view the world, and the impact of minority audiences on the general market. Are we doing enough to account for this in data and in market research? So why do we even need to think in uh, more proactive terms about minority, and minority audiences? Why are they important? Well, there are some predictions that we'll be living in a majority minority country in the upcoming decades. Conservative predictions believe we could be looking at about 38% for minority groups by the year 2050, and I think the Ronnie Mead Foundation uh, augment that. But beyond that, this group also has huge levels of spending power. 4.5 billion in disposable income is what they call the, the, the black and brown pound, the, the combined spending power disposable income of ethnic minority groups. And Gen Z account for an even larger slice of that pie. 
But beyond the explicitly obvious moral and ethical reasons why this audience is important, they're an audience who are willing and able to spend on products and services, provided that they have buy-in with your brand's approach to their ethical and diversity-oriented concerns. Truly understanding your audience is one thing, but for many of you, I'm sure you've heard the word authenticity over and over again over the past few years. We had to sneak it into the title of our presentation. Authenticity and credibility go hand in hand, and credibility, or the lack of it, is mistake number two. Most brands who fail to engage minority groups fail upon credibility lines. At Word on the Curb, we say diversity is a reality and inclusion is a choice. And for many individuals across the underrepresented spectrum, the reality is, and has always been, that they've been misrepresented, unaccounted for, and mistreated across so many areas of society. So over the past few years, when we've seen a monumental shift in the marketing industry trying to choose to engage with these groups, it's no wonder why some consumers are at times confused and skeptical. The modern consumer also keeps receipts close to their chest, and I'm not talking accountancy or bookkeeping. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the storing of receipts in the digital sense, the idea that digital footprints that brands and individuals leave in their statements, ways of working, and advertising messages of old can be uncovered at any, to at any point. As soon as messaging in the present doesn't match your brand's messaging and current reality in the, in the past, questions will be asked, and rightfully so. So how do you address and build present-day credibility to authentically engage with minority audiences and audiences at large that you haven't engaged with before? And we believe it's based on three things. Honesty, longevity, and reciprocity. And I'll cover each of these. So, honesty, I'll keep it short and sweet. Avoid fabricating the truth. Be less like Boris Johnson and be more yourselves. Um, ultimately, brands are run by people, so be more human. Secondly, and a point which speaks to our journey and some of the things that you can potentially see on the slide, good things take time to build and maintain. We've spent the best part of a decade building the Word on the Curb ecosystem initially as a YouTube channel, built out of the frustrations that we found ourselves in at the University of Manchester. As two extremely studious, trust me we were, young men at university, the experience of getting aggressively stopped and searched on our way home from the university library, studying biomedical material science and history is a very, very key memory that I'll never forget and was the catalyst to start what we did. We felt that more could be done in the media industry to accurately portray misrepresented groups. So we put our pennies left of our student loan, went into Manchester Arndale Centre and asked a guy at Jessup's what's the best camera to buy to film content on the street. And with a bit of blind faith, we spent probably the best £300 we'd ever spent in our lives. Teaching ourselves how to film and edit, we proclaimed to our friends that we're going to build a platform that truly explores youth opinion across current affairs, topical issues, and allows storytelling amongst the melting pot of people we found ourselves in Manchester. And that's what we did, and we continue to do that along with other things. And we just do it with better cameras, a bigger team, and across the globe. Building one of the most well-known online content brands has allowed us to realize that followers want more than just viewership. They love our content, but they want to be authentically part of what we do. And good things take time. It's, like I said, taken us a decade to get here. But the matter of fact is that most individuals in marketing companies who look at their job roles in two to three year cycles miss out on the fact that actually you can build communities through longevity. So realizing how active our audience were and wanted to be we decided to, and for years, have been providing a number of different initiatives. A completely free to sign up weekly opportunities mail out, which gives drop opportunities to our community. Free and subsidized events to attend. 
a mayor-backed program run to improve the production capabilities of disadvantaged young Londoners. The list goes on. And from that, we were able to take 20,000 plus individuals off of our 180,000 wider following to become part of our dedicated Curb community. These group of people are purposefully built to overrepresent underrepresented groups across ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and economic factors. They feed into how we work across research, comms, and as consultants. As I said at the top, I want to leave ample time. So we'll skip over this slide, but that shows you some of the demographics of what I've just discussed. And we'll get into some case studies of how we do this. So as Undu mentioned, we've worked with various brands from the Home Office to NHS to YouTube to Unilever to Spotify. But one of the most pertinent pieces of work that we produced, I think, of late was on behalf of Adidas. So we collaborated um, on a strategic piece of research last year with Mother London for Adidas. And Adidas's premise was that if they're to win in sportswear, then they need to win with Gen Z, multicultural Gen Z. And so they came to us to speak to young people in seven corners of the world, as you can see here, um, to unpack their lives as young people in those specific and culturally nuanced locations, their ambitions, their habits, their behaviors, their feelings towards sportswear and athleisure, to land on the sort of insights that could enable them really to position themselves with that audience and to engage them long term and build brand equity. And so using a digital ethnographic and quantitative approach over a six week period, we were able to unpack so much more than just their attitudes towards sportswear and athleisure. We unpack the unique tensions that exist in their cities. For example, the hustle culture that exists amongst young people in London to the political repression that exists in Moscow to the suffocating competition of New York. And if we go on to the next slide, with all of these challenges that they face, the pressure not only to care about global and environmental challenges, but also to solve them, the pressure to care about the philosophy, ethos, and practices of brands, that burden can often be a very weighty one, as I'm sure you guys can understand. And so when they don't always fit neatly under those labels, they can often feel like hypocrites, but they own it. And they ask you, aren't we all hypocrites? Don't we all desire to remain sustainable, but also keep a nicely updated wardrobe? And what we learned whilst doing that, if you just go back to the last slide, what we learned that whilst they do desire to have brands that are community focused and have positive intentions, fundamentally, the philosophy of a brand can often take a backseat role to simply having a high quality product. Which brings us on here. So this was Emily in New York talking about just that exactly. But one of my favorite contributors to our research on the next slide is Cecil. And Cecil, who's a fairly well-known contributor to our research, but also a, sort of a, a bit of a cultural tastemaker. He's very well-known to people who are fans of Arsenal Fan TV. As part of our research, he told us um, this quote, but it was couched, or well, the context behind it was um, really depicting what we call the comfort in contradiction, the tug of war that exists amongst young people between being conscious, but also having some sort of cultural capital. So here, speaking about Nike, he says, Nike is obviously the best. I've always sided with Nike. They represent my favorite footballer, Thierry Henry. Owning Nike is like a rite of passage. But then later on in the research, he says, Nike thrives off our community and culturally appropriates some elements of our culture for their own gain. They've got us by the bulls, which I think very adequately depicts and uh, brings home the message of the tug of war that young people are going through with regard to how they interact with the brands that they love. If we go on to the next slide. The brands that will win though, and not just the brands, but also the individuals, are the brands and individuals who flaunt their flaws and own their truths. Those are the ones that will win with this audience. For example, Ryanair, who comically own their sometimes frustrating approaches to cheap travel. Hot girls admitting to also having IBS, like it's something that you can have and still be a hot girl. Or still being a big fan of Will Smith despite some of his actions at the Oscars. Many of the young people that we spoke to basically told us, well, he's still a human being and he's 
fallible just like the rest of us. There seems to be a desire amongst young people to fall into this usage of the word, as Undu has mentioned, authenticity. We like to call it transparency. And this clamor to be real has been underlined by the rise of the new social media app, Be Real. Now, whether it sticks or not remains to be seen, but what it seems to be suggesting is a behavioral shift, a behavioral pattern edging towards a desire for transparency amongst this audience. Again, we, um, in one of our latest omnibus surveys, we polled our audience asking them whether they thought it would be a good idea, of which 40% of young people in our community said that they think it is. But beyond speaking to young people broadly, and again, this comes back to understanding the nuances that exist for minority audiences, there's a very, very important thing to understand about being able to speak to minority audiences whilst also accounting for the wider group. And that's what we're able to do because of the numbers that we have in our community. Because we overrepresent with underrepresented groups, we're able to boost on minority numbers, particularly when we undertake quantitative research. So if we take a, this uh, example uh, to hand, we asked our young people, who are your sort of social media favorites, personalities? And Nella Rose scored very low amongst the white British cohort, but particularly high. She was a hero amongst ethnic minority groups. And so this really underlines the importance of understanding those ethnic nuances and understanding the cultural importance that particular people have with regard to particular groups. And again, for any organizations that are rolling out talent campaigns or collaborations, these are the sorts of things that you ought to be considering. So I can see the people on the side lurking saying we've got two minutes. So um, marketers love free pillar strategies and takeaways. So here are the takeaways of what we've just said. I mean, number one, focus on the long term, not the short term. Number two, in every group, yes, there's nuance. But what we like to do when we speak to groups that we never have spoken to is pigeonhole them together. So it's more important to look at the nuance of minority groups than other groups. And finally, we know it isn't an easy task. This stuff is really hard. And so a very quick win will be to work with partners who do this and live and breathe this. And one way that you can do that, as I said at the top, there's a prize for the best question. We are launching an omnibus survey, which we're going to be rolling out to the wider marketing community. And what that omnibus survey allows you to do is to poll our community every single week and get a minimum of 1,000 responses within 72 hours. So for you guys in the audience, if you scan this QR code, if you hit us up after, if you email us, you're going to get a nice little discount to this omnibus service. You'll be able to click through, create a meeting with us. We can talk you through the service in more detail. And you can start getting engaged and in the hearts of Gen Z, millennial, and minority groups. Is everyone scanning it? <laughs> I'm not going to change the slide yet. Um, we'll leave it up. We'll leave it up. But for anyone who can't scan it, we're going to be here probably at, at the bar somewhere. Um, so just catch us. Come and speak to us. I don't know if we've got time for questions. Oh, we do have time for questions. Let's jump in. OK, there we go. First of all, Ndu and Hale, thank you so much. That's really insightful. Um, we've got a couple of questions, actually. So one question was, with your community, I, I mean, how deep does that go? Does it go back into schools? Are you looking at expanding it? How do you see it evolving it over the next couple of years? D does it, sorry? Does it go, like, how will you evolve that community? over the next couple of years? Yeah. Is it going back into schools, things like that? So in research, there are sort of two ways in which you can build communities. There's one which is a passive sort of recruitment approach, and then one which is, I guess, a more proactive one. Our passive recruitment approach is based on our YouTube audience. So as um, Undu alluded to, we have a, a, a reach of 180,000, which is continuously growing. And we're able to reroute some of that audience into our research community, and that's our passive approach. But in terms of a proactive research approach, we are going out working with um, people within our network, influencers, talent, so on and so forth, to get the word out to young people that it's a reciprocal community. It's not just about being part of a community where you're going to be paid for research. It's about being part of a bustling community in which they can actually have genuine value, be accorded opportunities, be accorded access into 
uh, to job, job opportunities, internships, access to creative events, discounted prices to, or discounted tickets, or sometimes free tickets to all sorts of events. Um, and so our aim at this moment in time is 20,000. We want to grow it quite, um, I guess, aggressively by the end of the year. So we're looking at attempting to get to about 50,000 by the end of this year. Okay. Amazing. Fantastic. And for the brands in the room that are keen to engage or agencies that are here that would like to know more, how do they get in touch? Are you guys around or how do they connect over Madfest? Yeah, like I said, we'll be around. Um, but email us, LinkedIn, Google, whatever, phone call, whichever is easier. But we'll be around probably at the bar, like I said. Cool. Indu, Hale, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Word on the cube.